Amen. So we're going to cover uh, John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9 tonight. John 7, 1 through 9. Did everybody have a good day? Yes. Anybody get a nap? <laughs> All right. This is the Feast of the Tabernacles. And in John chapter 7, verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he could not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of the Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For there is no man that does anything in secret. He himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. And his brethren, of course, is Mary's other children. Okay, this is his family. Anybody ever get challenged by your family? <laughs> Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Verse 8. Go up into this feast, but I will not go up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. Well, you could read that and just kind of gloss over it and say, okay, so his brothers really were challenging him to go and let the world know who you are. And uh, it's all about timing, isn't it? Everything's about timing in God's kingdom. So let's go back to verse 1. And I think the first things we learn is that he walked in Galilee because the Jews were trying to kill him. So let's take a look at that. John chapter 5, if you'll just turn back a couple of chapters. In John chapter 5, verses 10 through 16, the Bible says, The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It's the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, this is the man that Jesus healed who was paralyzed. In verse 11, he answered them and said, He that made me whole, the same said to me, Take up your bed and walk. So then they asked him, What man is that that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? And he that was healed did not know who it was, because Jesus had conveyed himself away. There was a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have been made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So the man departed, and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him whole. And therefore the Jews sought to persecute Jesus, and they sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Man, we can get so blinded to the purposes of God. You know, we can get so wrapped up in, wait a minute, you can't do this. This is during the service. I've been in some services that were totally interrupted by the Lord, and miraculous things happened. Uh, I want to tell you just one quick story here. It's a little bit warm tonight, so I'm going to take this coat off. Yeah. So, uh, how many of you know Ron and Barbara Hall? They usually sit right down in here. Okay. Well, Ron and Barbara were there when this happened. But I went into church one morning, good shot, I went into church one morning and uh, we got ready for the service and the, the worship team had an awful time doing worship. They just kept stumbling around and so finally I just, I kind of signaled to Ron, you know, let's just go forward with the service. So I got up and I was so hindered I couldn't even share any scriptures at all. It was like there was a a block wall in front of me. And uh, I just said, Church, I don't know what's going on here this morning, but let's all begin to pray and ask God to expose what's happening in this building this morning because the worship team couldn't come forth and neither can I. 
So we all bowed our heads and we began to pray. And all of a sudden the Lord spoke something to me. He showed me that we had three witches in the church. Uh, you know what warlocks and witches are. So I just continued to pray. And uh, the Lord told me you need, to, you need to ask them to come up and repent. And I thought, well, the church already thinks I'm crazy. If I do that, it's really going to seal the deal. But the Lord kept showing me nothing's going to happen here. Nothing's going to happen. So finally, I, I said, church, okay, we're, we're done praying. The Lord showed me what the problem is. I wish Ron and Barbara were here to witness this. But some of you have been here when we've talked about this. I said, the Lord shows me there's three witches this morning in our congregation. I don't know who you are. Because we used to get visitors all the time. We were up at the beach in Avila Beach. So we'd, 25% of our congregation every Sunday was visitors, you know, vacationers. And so I never know who was coming in there. But uh, nobody moved. Nobody did anything. So I jumped to the next step, which was I said, okay, you have 30 seconds to get up here and repent or I'm going to curse you in the name of the Lord. And I just held my watch just like that. And I said, five, ten. I got to 22 seconds and three people stood up and came forward. One uh, elderly woman that was all kind of bent over. And she actually looked like your typical witch you read in a storybook. <laughs> She had that grizzled face and kind of bent over. And then it was a younger couple that was with her. And they came up and stood in front, just like, like the Lord pushed them forward. And of course, the people are looking at me now like, what's going to happen? And the first thing that happened is the young couple kind of split off to that side. And this, uh, two, of, two of my deacons, Tom and Tiny, grabbed them and went over in the corner and started talking to them. But this woman stood in front of me, and the first thing the Lord told me, don't touch her. Don't you put a hand on her. So I just looked at her. Because sometimes we want to pray for people, we want to put our hand on their head and pray for them. The Lord said, don't touch her. So I'm standing there, and I'm looking at her, and involuntarily, my arm shot out from me, and I said something in the Spirit, and I have no idea what it was. But it was so powerful that it looked like somebody punched her in the face and she hit the deck like a ton of bricks. And it was a very few short words. I know it wasn't Greek. It was some other spiritual language. And I, it just came out instantly, involuntarily. And this woman just fell down and hit the deck. And then I felt this overwhelming feeling of love come upon me. And I, I got on my knees and, and, and she had her head bowed like she was ashamed. And I said, I want you to look at me. And I said, if you'll repent and renounce Satan and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, God will deliver you. And I know that sounds really bold, but that's exactly what happened. So I shared with her the gospel. I shared with her Romans Road. And then I said, if you'll renounce the devil and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God will save you. And man, I wish Ron and Barbara were here because they were sitting right where Marcia and Nancy are sitting in the second row and they saw the whole thing. So um, she prayed with me. She renounced the devil. And when she stood up, I kid you not, when she stood up, she stood up straight and she actually looked beautiful her face changed and it was a real miracle that happened in our church I don't know what Tom and Tiny did with this young couple I wasn't paying attention over there I just figured they know what they're doing they're, they're dealing with that well that young couple never came back they never came back but that elderly woman came back three or four times and got into worship and then we never saw her again so I don't know what happened to her but my whole point is, is that everything is about timing. And we can't put God in a box and draw a little box around him and say, okay, we are going to have church from 
10.30 in the morning till 5 to 12 and we're cutting it off. And I've been in churches like that where at 5 to 12, no matter what was happening, boom, you're out of here. And, and then the church emptied out within seconds. And you look around and it was like a cemetery. But I believe that what Jesus was trying to tell his family here in John chapter 7, the Jews are trying to kill me. That's why I'm not going into Jewry. And I'm going to stay here in Galilee, even though they were prodding him to go to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles. So I want to look at another scripture, John chapter 15. God will do amazing things if we just open the door and let him, amen? And I mean, there's silliness. I've been in churches where there's a lot of silliness and stuff that wasn't of the Lord too. So we have to be really discerning about what's from the Lord and what's not from the Lord. So in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, and again, we're talking about the Jews want to kill Jesus. John 15, verse 18 says, Jesus speaking, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you, or love his own. But because you were not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now remember the word that I said to you, that the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And if they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. Verse 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they don't know him who sent me. So this brings me to what, what stand we took when the pandemic hit and all the churches closed. And we prayed as elders, and the Lord showed us, don't panic, don't run in fear, don't run away. You have a Savior that protects you. So we made a stand to, to stay open. And there was one point when we had to close, but for the most part, we've been open almost since the pandemic started. We were closed just a few weeks. And when we made that decision, a lot of people really got upset. It's all about God's timing. And my big question was this. Why are Christians trying so hard not to be persecuted? God says, don't forsake the gathering of the saints together. God says, sing praises unto my name. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. God says, greet one another with a holy hug. God says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. God says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He says, call for the elders of the church and let them anointing. You can't do any of that on a Zoom meeting. None of it at all. And so we made the decision, we're going to stay open. And man, we got persecuted for it. But we stayed open and praise God, God brought us through without really any much problems at all. We, we got a few phone calls. We got rebuked a couple of times. But the bottom line was, we stayed open. Amen, Robert? And people were saved, and people were ministered to, and we did baptisms, and we did all of those things. And I know the the other side, the scared side, the fearful side said, "But, but what if somebody gets sick? People get sick every year of the flu. People die every year. There's thousands that die. If you're Christians, the worst thing that can happen is you're going to go to heaven. So again, it's all about knowing God's purposes, God's timing, and then really it's about obeying the Lord. And I'm sure when Jesus' brothers, uh, or his brethren, probably his sisters too, were his half-brothers and sisters were kind of pushing him, go to Jerusalem with us, he had to obey the Father. It's not my time. My time isn't yet. So in John chapter 16, the Bible says, tells us that Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They will throw you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time will come that whoever kills you thinks that he's doing God a service or a favor. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So we are going to get persecuted. Persecution is going to get worse. 
People are coming against morality. They're coming against Christianity. And we have to face up that God chose us for this generation. He chose us to stand and speak. And I'm not sure all what it'll cost us yet, but I know that it cost Him everything. It cost Jesus everything. So, in verse 2, we're going to go back to John chapter 7 now. The Bible says the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So, during the Feast of Tabernacles, or it's called Sukkot, the Jewish people were to gather together in Jerusalem, not only to remember God's provision in the wilderness, but also to look forward to the promise Messiah or Messianic Age when all the nations would flow into the city and worship God. So it was a feast for all people. And I think his brethren weren't really wrong in saying, let's all go to Jerusalem. But Jesus heard from the Father. And you know, there's times that the Bible says in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Sometimes we can lean to our own understanding and think something's okay. We better check with our Father first. Amen? We better check with our Father. So the Feast of Tabernacles is unique in that the Gentile nations were invited to come up to Jerusalem along with the Jewish people to worship. And the Lord told Moses to gather all the men, women, children, along with the foreigners in their lands so that they could learn to fear the Lord. And that's in Deuteronomy 31.12. So when Solomon later dedicated the temple at Sukkot, he asked the Lord to hear the prayers for any foreigners would come there to pray. That was in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 32 and 33. Could you turn there with me? 2 Chronicles chapter 6. It's after the book of, books of Kings. 2 Chronicles 6, and starting with verse 32. So this is Solomon's prayer. He says, Moreover, concerning the strangers which is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country, for thy great namesake and thy mighty hand and thy stretched out arm, if they come and pray in this house, then hear them from heaven, even from your dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calls to you for, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do the people of Israel." that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. So it may surprise someone that Jesus kept the Feast of the Tabernacles as well. The Bible says on the last great day of the feast, he stood in the temple and cried out these words. And these are found in, later in the book of John. We're going to get there in a few weeks. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And of course that living water is the life of God. It's it's the joy of the Lord. It's the word of God. It's those things that people see in us. So in verse 3 his brethren therefore said to him depart from here and go into Judea so your disciples can see the works that you're doing. Okay if you're not going to go to Jerusalem then at least Go over to Judea so that your disciples can see some of the miracles that you're doing as well. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, verse 46 through 50. The Bible says, while he was yet talking to the people, his mother and his brethren stood outside and they wanted to speak with him. You know, typically, even today, if your mom or your dad or your family comes, you take some time to talk to them. Amen? But Jesus was ministering, and he knew that his father had him ministering. So verse 47 says, someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brethren are standing outside. They want to speak with you. And he answered and said to them, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples And he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So because we have the same Father, that's why we call each other brother or sister, because we have the same Father. 
which is in heaven. And I have to tell you, I've talked to some people that said, you know what, you can't choose your blood family. But you, you can choose the brethren that you choose to be with. And I, and I have to be honest with you, sometimes I think you get closer to your brothers and sisters in the Lord than you do your own family. It's amazing, but you can really build that relationship. So in Acts chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, the book of Acts, chapter 1, starting with verse 12, after Jesus rose up into the clouds and went back to his Father, in verse 12 the Bible says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem about a Sabbath day journey. That doesn't mean it takes a whole day to get there. They weren't allowed to walk far on the Sabbath day. So as long as it took them to get to the temple, that's how far of a walk it was. Verse 13, when they came up, when they came in, they went up into the upper room where there stayed Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Isn't that something? Now it appears that his brethren finally got it and they're joined in with the disciples. They finally realized who Jesus was. So in John chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, it goes on in, in this story, in the book of Acts, they, they got wise. But here in this story, they still didn't believe in him. You know, have any of you ever witnessed to your family and they just shut you down? They don't want to hear it? We know who you are. We used to change your diaper. <laughs> on and on they go. That has nothing to do with salvation whatsoever. But a lot of times your own family will push you away because of the gospel. But God told me something a long time ago and I want to encourage you if you've ever experienced that. If you'll go to everybody else's mom, dad, sister, brother, cousin, whoever, and share the Lord with them, God will send somebody to yours. And that's usually the way it works, because Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own house and in his own country. I have pastors tell me all the time, and I've experienced it, where sometimes where you preach, people have a hard time receiving because they see who you are. And the fact of it is, we are all flesh and blood. We're all human. I tell people all the time, God may anoint me when I'm up here preaching and teaching, but the minute I step back down there, that, that is not who I am. I am being used by the Lord right now. When I step down, I hope to be used by the Lord, but I'm just like anybody else. I, I, I have to walk the same way. I have to... Uh, go to bed and wake up and be tired and all the things that everybody else goes through. I remember my first pastor. Every time I ever saw him, he had a suit and tie on. I never saw him without a suit and tie. I'd go to church Tuesday night, Wednesday night, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. He always had a suit and tie on. And one time, uh, somebody from the church needed me to go to his house to pick up something to bring it back to the church. And I said, so where does he live? And they told me. So I went to his house and I knocked on the door and he opened up the door and I was like, he had on tennis shorts and a t-shirt. Apparently he had been playing tennis in the backyard with his kids. He was all sweaty. His hair was all messed up. And to me it was like, he's human? Yeah. Yeah, he is. And he proved that all to us later as well. <laughs> but the fact of it is, you follow any one of us around long enough and you're going to get stumbled because we're human and God doesn't want us to keep our eyes on people. He wants us to keep our eyes on Him. I've had people tell me, I'll never step in another church again. I've been too offended. And I tell them, so do you think God did that to you or did people do that to you? Well, it was the people. Okay, but it wasn't the Lord. So why are you punishing the Lord? 
Why don't you just worship the Lord and love the Lord and ignore and forgive those people and let God deal with them and you just go on with God? And see, the Satan uses that all the time. Oh, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, of course we are. I tell people, bankers are hypocrites. Lawyers are hypocrites. Doctors are hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. We all say one thing and sometimes do another, don't we? There's hypocrites everywhere. Thank God we don't worship hypocrites. We worship the Lord God. I've had people come to me and say, why don't you say something to that brother? You know what I tell them? Hold on just a second. Nope, no holds there. I'm not the one that was crucified. I'm not the one that rose from the dead. And I'm not the one that judges that person. I'm the guy that speaks the truth and then I get down and love the people. That's the Holy Spirit's job. If they're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit, they're not going to listen to you. Amen? So we just simply love people. Now, if they come to you and say, well, what does God think about bank robbery? Oh, pfft, you just turn to the Scripture and tell them. You know, what does God think about adultery? You turn to the Scripture and show them. But if they don't ask, God shows us things sometimes so we can pray. Amen? He shows us things so we can pray that God will change their heart. Because we're not we can't even change ourselves. God has to change us too. Okay, so back to this. His family didn't believe in him. Let's take a look at Mark chapter six. Mark chapter six, verses one through six. That hurts when your own family won't receive you, amen. Mark 6 says, And he, that's Jesus, went out from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him there. So, you can imagine the conversation. I want to take you guys to where I was born. I want to, I want to take you to where, to where I live, in Nazareth. I want to take you there. So they all go to Nazareth. And when the Sabbath day came, he, was, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many people who heard it were astonished. And they said, where does this man learn these things from? What wisdom is this which is given to him, that even such mighty works are worked by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And aren't, we his, sis and aren't his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. You know, I think sometimes we make a huge mistake by judging the vessel rather than the message. Amen? I heard one of the most powerful messages I've heard in a long time recently. But the guy sounded like a demon. Man, when his voice first came on, it was like, whoa, that'd be hard to listen to every Sunday. His voice was just kind of real scratchy, and I just want to tell you. That kind of a voice, it's like, man, I don't know if I can listen to that for an hour. But the Lord showed me, I want you to listen to the message. Don't judge the messenger, listen to the message. And I listened to the message, and it was about the persecution that's going to happen in these last days. And everything was totally scriptural, and he was right on the money. So sometimes I think we, we get our eyes on people instead of getting our eyes on the Lord. And these people in, jo in Jesus' hometown said, wait a minute, isn't he Mary's son? Isn't he a carpenter? Where did he learn all this? Hey, his brothers and sisters are here with us. And they were offended. Verse 5 says, he couldn't do any mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And so he went round about the villages teaching. How sad. The Savior of the world visited his hometown. They totally rejected him. In another part of Scripture, they actually took him to the edge of their city and tried to throw him over a hill. <laughs> Can you imagine? And the Bible says, and I've heard some people preach, well, he just disappeared. No, he didn't. The Bible says he walked right through the midst of them and nobody touched him. He had power. The power of God, because He is God. So in verse 6, we're going to go back to Matthew 7 now. Is this coming through okay? 
Not losing anybody? Okay. John chapter 7 and verse 6. Jesus said to them, My time hasn't come yet. Your time is always ready. So Jesus tells his family that his time hasn't come yet. And I want us to take a look at John chapter 2. Everything's about time in Scripture. You know the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time and a season to every purpose under heaven. The Bible says in verse 11 in chapter 3 that God will make all things beautiful, but it's in His time. So we have to wait for God. And so in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, this is the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to come to this marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they don't have any wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. Can you imagine? He listened so closely to the Holy Spirit that God told him to wait until it was the perfect timing. You know, they could have crucified him the first year. He was around for a whole year doing miracles. They could have grabbed him the first year and crucified him. Or the second year. But God's timing said, no, it needs to be after three years. Did you know that the number three is God's perfect number? It's God's perfect number. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sun, moon, stars. Body, soul, spirit. Number three, God uses it everywhere. Even if you look at an atom in an electron microscope. You'll see a proton, a neutron, and an electron. It's made up of three parts. And so, we have to recognize that God has a perfect time. Jesus tries to tell them that. And then he tells them the truth in John chapter 7 and verse 7. He said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify of it that the works of it are evil. Man, there's a hint right there. I don't know why we get so shocked when we see all the craziness going on around us. Jesus said the world is evil. Think about 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. It says, Brethren, we know we're of God, but the whole world lies in wickedness. He told us 2,000 years ago, the world is evil. The evilness happens here because Adam and Eve gave up the authority to run this world to the enemy. And now the world system is run by the enemy. Think about government. Think about what everything is built upon. Jesus gave us a hint in 1 Timothy chapter 6. What is the world built on? Money. Money brings power, brings possessions, brings control brings everything. And the whole world's in love with money. And Jesus said a man's life does not consist of the things he possesses in abundance. What will a man do? Will he sell his soul and gain the whole world? What will that profit him? Not one thing. But that's what the whole world's built upon. Look, God owns the earth and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. That's that's Psalm 24.1. And Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. But the Scripture tells us, Do not love the world. 1 John 2.15 Now the world is the world system. It's not the earth. Okay, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world is passing away. He might as well have said the world system is passing away. But he that does the will of God abides forever. And I don't know, sometimes I think we, we want to kind of blend in so we can just at least have some peace. Jesus didn't have any peace in the world. He was constantly persecuted. And if truly we're serving the Lord... People are going to come against us. We just have to accept it and move forward. You know, it's not our job to save anyone. It's just our job to, to be the light of the Lord.
to share the gospel with people. And if they don't accept it, don't be offended. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the gospel. So, in 1 John chapter 4, 1 John is uh, near the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 4, and verse 4, the Bible says, You are of God, little children. You have overcome them. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Think about that. We're overcomers. We have overcome them. We are of God. Verse 5 says, They are of the world. Therefore they speak of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God won't hear us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So look, if we're out there and people don't want to hear it, they don't want to listen, go to the next one. There's all kinds of people in the world. We don't have to just work on one. If they're not going to hear it, go to the next one. Pray for the one that you just left. Go to the next one. There's all kinds of things we can do to bring God's light into this world. It's, we're going to get rejected. 1 John 2, I just uh, shared it so we don't need to go over it again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, is it okay to have possessions? Jesus did. The Bible says he didn't have anywhere to lay his head, but everywhere he went, there was food. And if there wasn't enough food, God made more food for him. They didn't go hungry. They always had a place to stay. They always had a place to go. But he wasn't concerned with owning things in the world. He was, con he was concerned about loving his father and obeying his father and pleasing his father. And so God will bless us with things. We all have things. We all drive cars and we have homes that we live in. We have nice furniture. We have refrigerators to keep our food cold. We have hot water in the morning. Just turn on the little knob. We have all those things. We're just not to love those things. We're to use those things for our blessing, but not to love them. You can never have enough good things anyway. It'll never, it'll never make you happy. Verse 8. Jesus told his brethren, go up to the feast. I'm not going up right now to the feast. My time is not yet fully come. So he tells his brothers to go up to the feast, but he says he won't go up there because his time hasn't fully come. And I think to better illustrate that, let's turn to John chapter 8. A chapter later than what we're studying here. John chapter 8, verse 12. Verse 12, Jesus said again to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. How many Christians do you know, and I've done this myself, where sometimes you just kind of slide the other way? People call it backsliding. Just kind of walk the other way and just pay a little bit less attention to the Lord. How many times has that worked out for us? <laughs> he always brings us back. Because he said, "He, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will no longer walk in darkness. So you have to assume if you're not following him, you're walking in darkness. Amen? Verse, verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, Oh, you are bearing record of yourself. Your record isn't true. Jesus answered and said to them, Though I bear record of myself, my record is true. Because I know from where I came and where I'm going. But you can't tell from where I came or where I'm going. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And if I do judge, my judgment is true. Because I'm not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Isn't it written also in your law that the testimony of two men is true? So I am one that bears witness of myself, and the Father also bears witness of me. Remember that? When Jesus got baptized? How God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. He actually got two witnesses right there, aside from the witness that John the Baptist gave, 
gave, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he himself said he was the light of the world. So there's four witnesses right there. Verse 19, they said to him, Where's your father? Jesus said, You don't know me or my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. So that brings a really important point across. We all have an appointed time. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. I have a good friend in Bakersfield. He's part of our motorcycle ministry, our black sheep motorcycle ministry. And I heard that he was in the hospital. I heard he wasn't doing well. And then I heard they put him on a ventilator. And I began to pray for him. But I was having a really hard time praying for him. And finally the Lord showed me, you're praying for a healing. Leave it right there. Because I may give him a heavenly healing, not an earthly healing. And God always heals. He is the healer. He will heal us no matter what. Sometimes we get a heavenly healing where we get healed so much so that we go to heaven. And that's what happened to my friend Tiny. The Lord decided it was his time. His time had come. And it was time for Tiny to go to heaven. And we are rejoicing about that because he loved the Lord. He had a great life. Towards the end of his life here, he was suffering greatly. Wasn't able to breathe. Uh, they cut his family off from him in the hospital. None of his loved ones could see him. He was crying out for somebody to come and pray with him, and nobody was there. It was, it was time. God had mercy on him. God took him home. And he'll be there forever and ever, and we'll meet him in heaven someday. And we have to look at things that way. Because we're not going to be here forever on this earth. We're not going to be here forever. There's an appointed time to each one of us. Each one of us has a season in a time. And of course we don't want him to go. The pastor that I met when I came to this church, Pastor Dave Meshagan, he's the one that originally founded this church in the 1960s. He was a father figure to me. He was a wonderful man of God. I loved him dearly and, and some of you in here knew him and loved him as well. And when he got sick I was so grieved and we laid hands on him and anointed him with oil and prayed for him. But somehow I knew in my spirit and he knew in his spirit that it was his time. And even the last day before he passed away, I went to visit him at his home. And he was, he was almost in a coma. And I was talking with him and he could barely speak. But just before I left, he grabbed me by the arm and he said, you feed those sheep. He was always concerned with God's house and God's people. And the interesting part of that was that I, I was not the pastor of the church when he said that. So I think he was prophesying to me. I think he was speaking from the Lord, from heaven to me, saying, you feed those sheep. Get prepared. Get ready. Because you're going to have an opportunity to speak my word and feed the sheep of God. You know who gets fed the most in here? Me. <laughs> the teacher learns the most. I learn when I'm studying. When I'm preaching, I learn. And when it comes back to me and I hear it, I learn. So praise God, we can all learn from the Lord. We're going to end this study with verse 9. It may not have been what his brethren wanted. But the Bible said when he told these words to them, remember, go on up, I'm not going yet. That was verse 8. Verse 9, he said these words unto him, he stayed still in Galilee. That's really hard sometimes to do. It's really hard to stay someplace when everybody else is moving. A lot of people are leaving California. They're leaving by the droves. I talked to a friend of mine who just moved to Idaho. He said, here's something interesting. I moved from an apartment that was around $1,200 a month to Idaho, and now I'm paying almost $1,900 a month. Idahoans are getting smart. All the Californians are moving there. They're jacking the prices up. He said, if I was to move from Idaho to California, the U-Haul truck is $1,000. If I'm to move from California to Idaho, the same truck is $8,000. 
I just talked to a friend of mine in Paso Robles. They're going to be moving to Tennessee. And he called up the moving company and he said, so we have a three-bedroom house. It's pretty standard. Your standard moving van will take care of it. And it used to be five, six thousand dollars. Twenty-seven thousand dollars. People are leaving California in the droves. You know what the Lord spoke to me? I put you where I wanted you. You stay where I planted you until I pluck you up and plant you somewhere else. And I think that's wise, wise counsel from the Lord. Don't make a move until God moves you. Because God puts us in a place for a reason. And yeah, sometimes we're unhappy there. It's not fun for us there. We want to leave and the grass is always greener. But you know what happens with the green grass on the other side? You take all your junk with you and then that grass doesn't look green at all. And it's amazing to me how many people have just said, we, we're done with California, we're done. And they move to another state. Don't move unless God moves you. If God moves you, hallelujah. Praise God. But if God wants you to stay, if you move, you're going to have to come back. I've got friends that have done that. Oh, California stinks. I'm moving to Oregon. Within a year, they were back in Santa Maria. And they did it three times. It's like, third time's the charm. Are you going to stay now? Don't you believe that God wants you to be here now? Amen. So Jesus stayed. And I want to read uh, some scriptures out of John chapter 12. Just two, two scriptures. John 12, verses 49 and 50. Now remember in verse 1 of chapter 7, Jesus walked in Galilee because the Jews were trying to kill him. In verse 49 and 50 of John chapter 12, he said, I have not spoken of myself. The Father who sent me gave me a commandment, whatever I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatever I speak, therefore, even as the Father says to me, so I speak. And I think that's probably the, the thing that got Jesus in the most trouble. He said what God told him to say. There's so many people out there that just want to say what people want to hear. And if you tell people what they want to hear, it doesn't help them. What, what they need to hear is God's truth. Amen. So I just want to go back over this. We're going to end a little early tonight. So this whole chapter was about the Feast of Tabernacles and whether or not Jesus should go there. And in the first verse, Jesus tells the disciples that, or his brethren, that the Jews are trying to kill him. So that should have been their first clue. Why would we want our brother to go to Jerusalem when they're trying to kill him? But they said, you need to go up with us. And in verse 2, uh, they talked about the feast. And in verse 3, they asked him to go to Judea to the feast. And in verse 4, they proved that they didn't even believe in him. And Jesus tells his family that his time hasn't come yet. And he testified to them the truth. They didn't want to hear it. But he told them the truth. The world's works are evil. We shouldn't be shocked at what we see. What we should do is minister where we can to the evil that's present. Instead of running away from all the craziness that's happening, we're trying to put together some ministries that will confront what's happening in this world and help people that are stuck in drugs and homosexuality and lesbianism and transgenderism and all this other stuff. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? So the world's telling them all, oh, this is perfectly normal. Today you can be James and tomorrow you can be Jamie. And the next day you can be a tree and the next day you can be a frog. It's unbelievable. So it's time for us to speak the truth. Amen. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So we're going to go ahead and close the study at that point. And I just want to thank you for being here. Happy Father's Day to you dads. Amen. Uh, and let's, let's close in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for our time that we spent here together in John chapter 7. I'm sure that was very difficult, Lord. 
that Jesus listened to your voice rather than the voice of the people that he grew up with. And at that time, he was about 30 years old, so he had been with that family for 30 years. So they had intertwined with each other. They knew each other. And I'm sure they loved each other. And I'm sure his brethren were disappointed, Father, when he told them, I'm not going with you. My time isn't come yet. And so, Lord, I just pray that when you speak to us, if it's wait, be still, and know that I'm God. If it's sit still, don't make a move. Or if it's go, that we'll be ready and willing to listen to what you tell us because we know that you have our best interests at heart. So I ask that you bless my brothers and sisters here tonight. Bless them, Lord. Thank you for their faithfulness here uh, today, Lord God, and tonight. And I pray rich blessings over them, Lord God. I pray that you will give them words in season to speak to those that they care about. And I pray you'll send them people that have an ear to hear what's coming from the Spirit of the Lord. I pray you'll open doors for each one of us, Father, for ministry. The world needs Jesus Christ. So I ask these things, Father, that you give us a blessed week, each and every one of us. Keep us safe, Lord, and from all harm. And thank you, Lord, for keeping us healthy. We pray these things and we thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.